Hello, my name is Latif Al Maktoum. I was born on December 5, 1985. Um, my mom is Huria Ahmed Lamara. She's from Algeria. My father is the uh, Prime Minister of UAE and uh, the ruler of Dubai, Mohammed bin Rashid Said Al Maktoum. He has uh, three daughters called Latifa. I'm the middle one. Uh, there's one older than me and one younger than me. And he has two daughters called Maryam also. Um, I have 30 brothers and sisters total. I had to say that uh, in case this video is discredited in any way that no, you know, there is a Latifa there and a Latifa there. Yeah, there's three Latifas. I'm one of them. I'm the middle Latifa. Uh, my full sisters are Metha and Shamsa. They're both older than me and Majid, he's younger than me. Um, and I'm making this video because it could be the last video I make. Pretty soon, I'm going to be leaving somehow, and I'm not so sure of the outcome, but I'm 99% positive it will work. And if it doesn't, then this video can help me, because all my father cares about is his reputation. He will kill people to protect his own reputation. He. He, he only cares about himself and his ego. So, this video could save my life. And if you are watching this video, it's not such a good thing. Either I'm dead or I'm in a very, very, very bad situation. So, where do I begin? In 2000, my sister Shamsa, while she was on holiday in England, she was... Um, 18 years old, going on 19, she ran away. And um, in the two months that she was free, we were in contact, and I was still in Dubai with my mom and my other sister, whereas she had traveled with her stepmom and, and all of them. Um, so while she had, she escaped because she didn't have much freedom in Dubai, she didn't have freedom to do the things that, you know, anybody in a civilized world would take for granted, like driving a car or traveling or, you know, just making choices for your own future. Um, freedom of choice is not something that, you know, we have. So when you have it, you take it for granted. And if you don't have it, it's very, very special. So yeah, she ran away and uh, the whole time she was communicating with me. And I was 14 years old at that time. And uh, yeah, Shamsa was... Um, I, I saw her almost as a mother figure. Um, yeah, she's my big sister. She was like a mother also to me because she really cared about me. I would speak to her every single day. So, yeah, when she left, it was a little bit um, hard. I was happy for her, but at the same time, I was worried about her. And uh, what she did was she also contacted one of her friends in Dubai, uh, whose name is Leila Harib. Um, and she kept calling Leila. And what my father has done is he went to Leila's house and he tried to bribe her with a Rolex and um, he said we need to tap your phone to uh, track Shamsa to see where she is. So they, that's what they did and Leila told Shamsa, she told her, my phone is bugged, uh, they're trying to find you, be careful. And Shamsa told me that and I told her, stop calling Leila because if you call her they're going to find you. I think she was very lonely in the UK by herself. She had nobody else to talk to, so she talked to us and she kept talking to Leila. So, yeah, after two months, they found her. Basically, she was on the streets and a bunch of guys in a car just drove up. They found her, they grabbed her, kicking and screaming, threw her in the car. Um, and she was driven somewhere by a helicopter. She was driven to a helicopter somehow, ended up in France, and from France she came to Dubai. Um, she was drugged uh, on the plane. It was a private jet, so nobody was checking anything. She was drugged, brought back to Dubai, and basically put in this building. Uh, uh, it's The building is called Khayma, which means tent in Arabic, but it's not a tent, it's just called a tent. And uh, it's on the, it's in Zabil Palace, it, uh, on the property of my stepmom, Hind. And she was kept there and locked there. And during that time, 
uh, we could send her some things like clothes or whatever so we snuck in a telephone for her we meaning me and my adopted sister Muna Muna Lamara we were in contact with her and we snuck in a telephone so we could talk to her so while she was inside she contacted some journalists in the UK and they released the story to the Guardian I think it was around May 2001 when the story came out I'm not really sure the story is Google Shams al Maktoum and it's the first things that come up her, her escape and all of that so when the story came out I think they realized that somehow she was in a communication or somebody was helping or whatever so uh, the police went and they took Muna from her university and they questioned and tortured her and uh, my sister Meta came to my room in the evening the same day and she said Muna was taken by the police and they're questioning her and beating her up basically what do you know about Shamsa? And Meta was kind of acting like, like the interrogator, you know, like, I'm going to interrogate you to get information from you. I said, I don't know anything. And uh, so, uh, anyway, I went and I, I told my other adopted sister, Fatma, Fatma Lamara, who, by the way, was kept in a cabin in our house. She was kept, so <laughs> another story. She's kept in a cabin on our property, but locked up, separated from the rest of the family because she's naughty. <laughs> Her naughty behavior. She's, she's rebellious. So she's basically kept in a cage in our house. And uh, anyway, I, I wrote a note for her and I told uh, our housemaid to give it to her, to slide it under her door. And she did. And I told her, you know, Muna's been taken and she's been questioned by the police and everything. And then Fatma just went crazy. She just, like, broke down the window She she and the door. She threw this the, the metal thing outside the window. She, she broke it. She got out. She took a knife. She was threatening uh, Ali, who is, um, like, he's, he's a, a chef, but he's also, like, the brother-in-law of my father's right-hand man. So he's kind of, like, in charge of the staff or whatever. So she took a knife and she was threatening him, like, I want to see Muna, I want to see Muna. So they took Fatma, they, they put her in prison and they tortured her also. And then they realized that she knew nothing. We didn't tell her because we couldn't tell her that we were in contact with Shamsa. Anyway, what happened after that? Yeah, so that day I kind of lost everyone. Uh, all my friends, all my my sisters, everything. I lost everyone that day. It was, it was a very hard day for me. And, uh, of course, I lost my communication with Shamsa. So, approximately a year later, as a 16-year-old, I decided that I'm going to escape. Uh, back then, I didn't have the internet. I didn't have... I was very... It's, it was 2002. I, I, internet existed, but I didn't have it. They, they wouldn't allow me to have internet. I didn't have a, internet. I didn't have phone. The only phone I had was given to me by my friend. Uh, so it wasn't approved by my family or anything. So I, I decided I'm gonna escape. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna leave UAE. I'm gonna find a lawyer in another country. Like I'm gonna go to Oman. I'm gonna just go there and I'm gonna go find a lawyer or, or something, and I'm gonna help Shamsa. And the worst case scenario, if they catch me, they're gonna put me with her. I'm gonna be in prison with her. So at least I can see her, and I'm happy. And she knows that she has somebody with her, and she's not gonna do any, anything crazy. She's not gonna hurt herself. She has her sister with her, so she's not gonna do anything, you know. So I was thinking either I get your help or I get put in prison with her. So in 2002 I escaped um, and they caught me at the border and um, yeah, like I was very, very naive. I thought you could just go. I thought you can just, there's like a border and then there's like sand or what. I didn't realize what the border looks like. I've never been to a border in my life. I didn't have the internet to, to research it. I didn't have anyone to talk to, to give me advice. I couldn't, I was totally by myself. I had no one. Nobody even knew what. Like, I mean, my people, my friends around me in school, like, they didn't know what I was going through. I couldn't talk to anybody about it. Um, so, yeah. And I wasn't allowed out. I, I wasn't allowed to go outside. Like, I, I was going to school. I would sometimes go to the family stables to horse ride. And apart from that, I didn't do anything else. 
and then I went home. So I did. I didn't have. I was. I didn't know anything. So yeah, I, they called me at the border basically, and then they found out who I was. They brought me back to Dubai, and um, my father's right hand man put me in prison under my father's orders, and then his uh, all his CID guys, they. Um, yeah, they, they put me in prison and they tortured me. Um, basically, one guy was holding me while the other guy was beating me. And they did that repeatedly. Uh, I think the first time they tortured me, I didn't feel any pain because I was in so much shock. I didn't. It was like somebody was hitting me through a pillow or something. I could see what they were doing, but I just... I was like, are they just destroying my body? What's going on? I didn't. I didn't even. The pain didn't register because I think I was in so much shock, and it was a long day with a little sleep, and I just the pain didn't. I didn't. I didn't feel the pain, and it was like a half-hour torture session. And then the next times I was tortured, it was for five hours. And yeah, I I, I was just pulled from the bed, driven to another location, um, in in the palace, uh, in the same building, the khema, the tent, which is not a tent. Uh, and yeah, they, they tortured me. Um, I knew how long it was because I had a watch. And um, they told me that your father told us to beat you until we kill you. That's his orders, your father's orders. Your father, the ruler of Dubai, that's what he said. So all of this public image that he's trying to portray, human rights, is bullshit. He's the most evil person I've ever met in my life. He's pure evil. There's nothing good in him. He's responsible for so many people's deaths and ruining so many people's lives. He doesn't care about anyone. He only cares about his image, his reputation. And he will gladly kill somebody, but he doesn't do it himself. He just he 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 doesn't do the dirty work work himself. He'll he'll just get other people to do it. He he doesn't care. After my uncle died, he killed one of his wives. He killed he killed her. Everyone knows about it. The Moroccan one, because she was too. Uh, her behavior was too outrageous, she was too... I, I think she just talked too much and he felt threatened by her, so he just killed her. Of course, he couldn't do that when my uncle was alive, but he could do that after my uncle died. Um, everybody knows what kind of person he is. So in total, I was in prison for three years and four months. I went in in June 2002, and I came out October 2005. I don't know, I'll do the math. But um, in 2003, for a week, I came out of prison. They put me back home. Home. It's not home. It's my house. My mom's house. They put me back there uh, for a week. And um, it was surreal. When, when I went home to see my mom, I expected some sympathy, maybe, since uh, prison was not... Uh, a normal prison experience. It was um, constant torture, constant torture. Even when they weren't physically beating me up, they would torture me. Uh, they would switch off all the lights. I was in solitary confinement by myself, totally. And there's no windows, there's no lights. So when they switch off the light, it was pitch black. They could switch it off for days. So I don't, I didn't know when one day ended and the next began. And and then they would, they would make sounds. To harass me and then they would come in the middle of the night pull me out of bed to beat me and uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't a normal prison experience by any means it was just torture and yeah, they didn't give me anything I didn't have uh, a change of clothes so I wore the same clothes and I would try to stay as clean as possible but you know after the torture sessions I couldn't even walk so I would crawl to the bathroom to get water to open a tap to get some water I would just crawl on my hands and knees there was no medical help at all they didn't care they wanted me dead anyway. And um, 
Yeah, so I, I, I didn't have anything. I had a, a thin mattress that had holes in it and had stains of blood and shit and it was disgusting, it smelled so bad. I had a thin blanket also, it was so disgusting. Um, and I had the clothes I was wearing and then I think in the last few months they gave me a toothbrush, just one toothbrush, you know? So I didn't, I didn't, it was so hard to stay clean. And at, towards the end they gave me uh, some clothes, clothes wash, like Tide you know, the clothes washing powder. So I would use that clothes washing powder on my skin to try to stay clean, you know? Uh, it was really disgusting. So yeah, so after that experience, I went to the house for one week and it was uh, from that to a house with soap and clothes and this and that. I, it, it was like a shock to me. So I would shower like five times a day because I could, there was warm water. There was there was soap, there was a towel, there was clothes. I couldn't believe it. There was toothbrush, there was food, like like proper food, not food in like little container, meat and rice, meat and rice. It wasn't like these little container boxes, you know? It was food. Like I can I can eat fresh food. Um I was very, very anemic when I came out. Uh, I had lost so much weight. Um all of my clothes were f hanging off me and I, I couldn't I needed to get new clothes. Um and everything was just a shock to me. So I remember, it's very weird, but I remember when I came out of prison for the first time, even in the car, I remember the car felt like it was going so fast because I had not moved for one year and one month. So the car felt like I was in a roller coaster. I was like, wow, this is just going so fast. And when I went home, having all these people talking normally to me, like normal, normal after what I've been through, I don't know what normal is anymore, you know, like nothing is normal. Every time, I mean, even now, I, I'm, if I hear a noise, I just wake up. And I remember for a few years after I came out of prison, whenever I could hear a noise outside the door, I would just jump up out of bed, you know, I would just jump. I wouldn't... And I would stand on my feet because I'm, I'm ready, you know, I'm ready for, for anything. Um, yeah. So, yeah. That wasn't a good time. So after a week of being at the house back with my, mo my mom, my sister, and she, she didn't show me compassion at all. Actually, what she said to me was, uh, you think your prison experience was bad? There's others that's so much more worse than that. And when that happened, I felt really, um, really disappointed and sad. I, I really expected some compassion from her, like like any as any kind of mother. But um, there was no compassion. I also didn't get any compassion from my sister, Metha. She didn't. But it's okay. You know. They could have helped me if they wanted to, but they didn't. But at the same time, they didn't put me inside. But they could have helped me. They could have visited me if they wanted to. They could have fought for me a little bit more. They could have had some compassion, but they, they kind of looked at me like, oh, you did this to yourself. No, I didn't. I didn't tell Shamsa to run away from England. I didn't tell her to keep calling Leila. I didn't tell her to get caught. I didn't, I didn't do this to myself. My only thing was I was trying to defend my sister and trying to help her and that's what happened to me so back to me being in the house so I only stayed in the house for one week because after one week I had somewhat of a breakdown I don't remember how exactly the fight started but I just kept screaming that I wanted to go see Shamsa and I, I couldn't stop screaming it was like I, I, I can't explain it I literally just kept screaming and screaming that I want to see Shamsa, I want to see Shamsa, I want to see Shamsa. And I ended up, like, I was physically trying to fight people, so they were holding me. And I don't remember who they called. They called the police, um, but at some point there was some men holding me again. And then there was a doctor. I saw a doctor, and she injected me. And then they took me either in a car or in an ambulance. I don't remember. I think it was a car, because I was just screaming. I couldn't remember. They, they tried to tranquilize me. It didn't work the first time. They put me in the hospital. I remember them putting sticking things on me, tranquilizing me again. And then I just remember uh, flashes of like being in the hospital bed and waking up and seeing people trying to feed me. And then, you know, like waking up in the bathroom and then waking up. Like I lost 
some time then I lost a few days I had no voice because I lost all my voice from all the screaming so yeah and, and and then it took me a while to I don't know how much they tranquilized me or what they gave me but I, I lost some days and um, and then yeah then I spent one week in the hospital and uh, with no voice and the, the nurses there were very 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 good and um, they were trying to make it as normal as possible for me like not not to treat me like a mental patient you know because I'm not a mental patient I told them what I went through you know with my very weak whisper I could I could talk to them and tell them like what happened to me and uh, they were really good and they tried to to make me feel mm, normal and anyway so after one week in the house and then one week in the hospital they put me back in prison again so in total I spent three years and four months in prison and um, I didn't know how long I'd be in there for they just told me you know your father said we'll beat you until we kill you and that's it and uh, yeah they, they didn't manage to kill me they wanted to but they didn't manage to so when I got out the second time when I got out of prison I um, I of course I I just uh, I hated everyone I didn't trust any people at all like for me all people were bad all people were not to be trusted all people they they were just against you you know like that's, that's how I felt so I, I spent a lot of time with animals with the horses with the dogs with cats with birds with uh, just different kinds of animals I would spend my, my days with animals and then I would go to my room and watch movies or something but I wouldn't interact with people I didn't have anyone I trusted um, and then I uh, yeah so it, it was it it took me I don't know I don't know how many years coming out of prison to to fully fully recover from that experience um, I don't know I don't know when I started to be more normal I don't know if I'm normal now I mean it's something that that really changes you you know makes you lose trust in people the summer of 2017 is when a lot of things changed that kind of pushed me to go like I, I can't wait any longer for Shamsa to get better so I can take her with me uh, I I realized you know this took me almost 10 years to realize that me being here is not helping her at all I can't help her here I need to leave and that's the only way I can help her that's the only way I can help myself I can help her I can help a lot of people is to leave being here I cannot help her at all so and also in, in 2017 I I lost a good friend in the summer and it it made me see how life is so 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 short you know there's no guarantees just just there's no reason to keep waiting for somebody to make a change or somebody to be ready there's no reason to keep waiting just go you know just make the big step go Shamsa will be fine without you and once you're gone you can help her so I need to make this video in case I don't make it it's not gonna be in vain uh, somebody will have some footage I have to I have to remember to say everything because this could be the last video I made I don't know what, what else to say uh, I don't know what else to say they will for sure try to discredit this video and say uh, it's a lie or it's an actress or something for sure uh, I don't know what else to say about me I, I, I'll i just say more information about me I went to, to Dubai English speaking school when I was a kid and then I went to International School of Shurafat and then for one year I went to the Latifa school for girls and then yeah when I got out of prison I was horse riding in Zabia stables and then I was scuba diving in Fujairah and then I started skydiving, skydive Dubai. So 
there's a lot of people who can uh, who know me they know my face they know how I talk they know me um, so even if they try to discredit me I hope some of my friends along the way will say I know Latifa and that's really her and you know anyway I look like my sister Meta um, I look like my brother Majid and they're both uh, famous figures so even if they try to discredit me I look like my siblings so and I've also given copies of my passport and my certificates and all of that stuff which by the way I don't have possession of my passport they won't give me my passport my UAE passport is never in my possession I just got a photocopy of it when I did my um, oh uh, my when, when I got when I did my GCSE exams after I, I left uh, prison I did some exams and they required a passport copy so I took a picture of my passport then and also when I did my my tandem rating for skydiving, um, the FAI, I think it's called, they require some medical clearance and which requires a copy of your passport. So I managed to copy the copy of my passport. They wouldn't even give me my passport, but they gave me a copy of my passport. So I'm not allowed to drive. I'm not allowed to travel or leave Dubai at all. I can't. I haven't left the country since 2000. Uh, I've been asking a lot to, just to go traveling to study to to do anything normal they, they don't let me um, I have to I have a curfew when I go out and I come back home I have to be back at a certain time uh, they my mom she always like she needs to know exactly where I am the drivers report back to my father's office where I go etc etc we have assigned drivers we're not allowed to get into anyone's car I have to go with the driver the driver has to know exactly where I am um, yeah, so that's my life basically. It's very restricted. I can't I can't even go to another emirate without permission. I can't so I have to be in Dubai. Um Yeah. So yeah, even if they try to discredit me, I have a lot of uh data that they can't discredit me. Well, they will try and then they will be discredited. Um, so yeah, this could be my last video. I hope it isn't. I hope I never use this video. I hope this video just gets deleted and we're all okay. Um, but this video needed to be made. I don't know what else I need to say. So, uh, what I'm hoping for after I leave is that I get my passport and I have freedom of choice in my life and I can help Shamsa from wherever I am. I can say, give her her passport, let her travel, let her see me. And I think that's the only way to help anyone, including myself. Uh, I, I don't know what else to say. I can talk about a lot of things that I've seen in my life. When, uh, when, when I was six months old, my my father's sister wanted me, <clears throat> so she took me away from my mom. Uh, so I lived for the first ten years of my life in the palace, believing that my aunt was in fact my mother, and I would visit my real mother maybe once a year I would never sleep there I would just spend the day and go go to the palace at night and uh, when my younger brother was three months old my mom also gave him well she she that one was more voluntary because she didn't want me to be alone so she gave my brother to me so that we're both together so yeah, for the first 10 years of my life, I was living a lie. Then I discovered who I was, and then I went to live with my mom, and I was fighting to go live with my mom. And Shamsa was fighting for, for us to go live with her. So I always saw Shamsa as this person who rescued me. So I was trying really hard to rescue her. So, But I, so far, I haven't been successful. Ah, oh, I don't know what else they'll probably do. They'll probably tell Shamsa to make some video talking about how I'm a liar or try to discredit me or something like that. For sure they will try to do that. <laughs> Knowing them. Of course she will. She has no freedom. 
she can't do anything, you know, she's, um, right now, she's, she has a psychiatrist with her, and she's surrounded by nurses, they're in her room when she sleeps, uh, they take notes of when she wakes up, when she sleeps, when she eats, what she eats, what she says, the conversation she says. They watch her take her pills. They make sure that she takes all of her pills. Uh, these these drugs to control her mind. I don't know what they are. And uh, so her life is totally controlled. Oh yeah, and in the summer also what happened, which I should have said, is um, um, Shamsa was discovered with a few mobile phones. So... Uh, my mom and my other sister, they got paranoid that she was going to try to contact the journalists in England again to talk to them about her, her situation or whatever. Try to, to tarnish uh, my father's reputation, basically. They were scared of that. So that's when her situation got more controlled. That's when the psychiatrist was brought in to stay with her full time. She was already dealing with psychiatrists, but n never somebody who was staying with her like, like as much as she is now. And full time nurses with her all the time. Basically, like, walking around with a cage following her, you know? So she has no, no freedom. So basically, yeah, I think, I think what they will do is they will try to use her to discredit me. That would be amazing. Because, um, yeah, they, they, will they will try to use her to discredit me. They will never be able to get me to discredit myself because, you know, they, uh, they're not going to take me back alive. Uh, so that's not going to happen. I don't know what else to say. I mean, this this has been like a crazy, almost two decades already since 2000 it started. We're in 2018 now. It's been it's been really really crazy. A lot of people, a lot of people's lives have been hurt. Um, a lot of people tortured. A lot of people lost their lives. Uh, a lot of things happened. You know, he he covers up a lot of murders. He doesn't care. My father. He's the worst criminal you can ever imagine in your life. And he has this image of so modern and all this bullshit. I have 30 brothers and sisters. He doesn't, he only puts the pictures and he, he has this, this public image like he's a family man. That's all, all bullshit. He doesn't. He, he, it's just PR. He has a son in Lebanon that he never sees. He saw he met him maybe once or twice and he gave him a handshake, you know, when when his son came to Dubai. He's he's neglected and so many so many of his kids. He's not he's not a father. He's really, really disgusting. Really disgusting human being. Um Yeah. The way he lives his life and the way he treats other people is not what's being portrayed by the media, his media. Remember, Dubai, the media is controlled, as is much of the Middle East. I don't know what else to say. I feel like if this thing kills me, or if I don't make it out alive, at least there's a video. It's sad that it's come to this point that I have to make a video, but I have to. I don't know what else to say. I'm trying to think of anything, everything. What else can I say about my life? Mm. I really hope I don't need this video. And um, I'm feeling I, I won't need it. I'm, I'm feeling positive about the future. I'm feeling like um, it's the start of an adventure. It's the start of, of me claiming my life, my freedom, freedom of choice. I, I don't expect it to be easy. Nothing's easy, but I expect it to be the start of a new chapter in my life and one where I have some voice where I don't have to be silenced and I can talk about myself, I can talk about Shamsa, I can talk about what happened with us 
Um, yeah. I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know how how I'll feel just waking up in the morning and thinking I can do whatever I want today. I can go wherever I want. I have all the choices in the world like anyone does. That'll be such a new, different feeling. That'll be amazing. I'm really looking forward to that. There's only so much you can do when you're trapped in a country and trapped by all these restrictions. There's only so much a uh, human being can do. I'm looking forward to that. And I'm looking forward to Shamsa having a better life. I'm looking forward to a lot of things. Um, yeah, I really feel like this is a, a, a start of just a new chapter in my life. I have uh, no reason to stay in Dubai at all. I, I have no reason to come back here. I have people I love, but they can come see me. You know, the people in my family who I care about, my friends, they can come see me wherever I am. And that's also hard because I don't know where I'm going to be after this. I have, I don't know where I'm going to be based. I don't know where, where I can live. I don't know anything. I don't know where I'm going. I really don't know. I know where I'm stopping. I know where, uh, where I have to be for a while, but I don't know where I'll end up. Which is kind of nice also. I have all the options then, hopefully. <laughs> Um, yeah. Did I forget to say anything? What do I talk about? Do I talk about all the, the murders? Do I talk about all the abuse I've seen? Do I talk about what? Um, I don't know what to talk about. Because that would be a very, very long story. I should, should know. He's responsible for a lot of deaths. He is a major, major criminal. Major criminal. There is no justice here. They don't care. Especially if you're a female. Your life is so disposable. They don't care. He's even burned down houses to hide the evidence. <laughs> He's burned down houses. He's crazy. I think it's time that he faces the consequences of all the things that he's done in his life. He will. He will definitely face the consequences. No matter what he does to me. All the torture, everything, I'm not scared of him. He doesn't scare me. He's pathetic pathetic human being and he's going to face the consequences of everything he's done not just to me but to everyone else he will face the consequences yeah okay i think i think there's nothing more in me to say now hopefully i don't need this video Any final words? <laughs> Any final words? Mm. Thank you to all my friends and to the people who really care about me and to, my, to the family members who do care about me. You know who you are. Not all of you care about me, but some of you do. Uh, thank you to those people. And uh, if I don't make it out, I really hope that some positive change will happen from all of this.